Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Carnegie, Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. I'm Jim Ketterer, and I'm the Dean of International Studies at Bard College and the Academic Director of the Bard Globalization International Affairs Program. And this is an event that that program, BGIA, is doing in coordination with the Carnegie Council. We're happy to be back here, and we thankful to, uh, to Joel and all of the staff here for having us back. We do one of these lectures together every semester, uh, and we do several other lectures throughout the, the semester. You can find us on all the various social media, our website, etc. The lectures are named after James Chase, who was the founder of BGIA, uh, was a leading scholar and writer in international affairs, the editor of World Policy Journal, also the editor of Foreign Affairs Magazine, which is a co-sponsor of all of our lectures, and we're happy to have their support. This is an event that I think James would very much like to have been in attendance at, a very important topic. Uh, and I'm happy to, to introduce our, our two presenters, uh, Scott Silverstone from the US Military Academy, where he's a professor of international relations and also a fellow at New America. And Malia Dumont, who's chief of staff at Bard College, is an uh, army officer in the reserves and worked uh, in the office of the Secretary of Defense on policy issues. Uh, they are going to talk for about a half an hour, maybe a little bit more. They'll open it up to Q&A. Then we can adjourn at 7 o'clock to a reception back here. And I'm told that there's a small select sample of the books that are available for sale and signing. And I certainly hope you avail yourselves of them. So with that, I turn it over to our presenters. Scott? Thank Hi. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So this is the book we're here to discuss. Uh, Scott's new book, very timely, um, great intellectual content from Hitler's Germany to Saddam's Iraq, the enduring false promise of preventive war. And I want to start off by asking you to just share with us um, what led you to, uh, towards this topic and why now? Okay, thanks for the opening question. Um, before I get into this, I do have to uh, have one disclaimer and a couple of thank yous. Uh, the disclaimer is I do work for the United States Army, which means everything that I say here tonight, uh, these are my own opinions. This is uh, the result of my own analysis. I'm not speaking on behalf of the United States government, the U.S. Army, the U.S. Military Academy, and now that I've made the lawyers happy, um, I can thank Joel Rosenthal and the Carnegie Council. This project, even though this project wasn't a Carnegie Council project, supported project, the idea of working on preventive war actually had its birth back in 2003 uh, when I had a fellowship with the Carnegie Council. So thanks for uh, the support back then. And to you, Joel, for hosting this event. This is fantastic. Um, I'm part of the BJA family. I've been teaching uh, for BJA for the last 11 years. Uh, and a lot of friends in the audience who are part of this uh, larger community. So it's really neat to uh, have this chance to come back and, and, and do full circle, connect Carnegie Council and, and uh, BJA as, as these two great uh, communities that I've been a part of. So this topic and the core argument, the core question that I'm taking on in this book is really a result of an obsession that I've had with the idea of preventive war since the run-up to the war in Iraq. Uh, 2002, 2003, during the debate over whether or not we should go into Iraq. And I've been studying the, the ethical and the strategic elements of preventive war since then. And as I was working through the literature, and there's very deep literature on preventive war, and we can define that term uh, in a bit for everybody, I came across this iconic claim. And this iconic claim was, or was coming to me uh, in parallel with a critique of preventive war as a strategy. I became very concerned that there was too much of a casual, lackadaisical approach toward this question of going to war under the logic of preventive war. And the iconic claim at the core of the book is that back in the 1930s, the British and the French missed a golden opportunity to stop World War II if they had only conducted a preventive attack against Hitler before 1939. And it's been a politicized claim. And given the fact that I was developing a critique of preventive war, I became obsessed by actually picking this case apart and leaving something behind on the history, but about the strategy as well. Great. So one of the topics that you really delve into in the book that's sort of at the center of it is 
what you call the preventive war paradox. Can you explain what that is and why it's important? So let me go back to sort of the ground definitions just to make sure everybody's tracking on what are we talking about in terms of preventive war? Because those of you who have, have followed the debate about um, the invasion of Iraq, should we use military force against Iran's nuclear infrastructure? The debate about, uh, against, uh, about uh, military force against North Korea and its nuclear program. The word we hear most often is preemption, right? And you see this word used by political leaders. You see it used in the press to characterize the conditions under which you are using military force. But what we're really talking about in these cases is preventive war. And um, these two terms have been conflated in a very dangerous way in my mind. The word preemption is about striking first, taking the first military move, when you actually have indicators an attack is coming in your direction. And under international law, under just war theory, and under smart strategy, if you know an adversary is about to attack you, is in the final stages of preparing an attack, you have no obligation to absorb that first hit. You can take the first strike and declare this legitimate self-defense. That's preemption. But in each one of these modern cases, whether it's Iraq and the argument about weapons of mass destruction that Saddam Hussein was allegedly developed and may use against uh, American friendly targets or may give to terrorists, whether we're talking about the Iranian nuclear program, whether we're talking about North Korea, this is not about an imminent attack. This is not about self-defense hitting before we are hit. Preventive war is simply, is simply about fear of the future. And you watch a rival state that's growing in power, and you worry about what's going to happen two years from now, five years from now, if you get into a conflict. If you get into a conflict five years from now, it will come at a higher cost than if you pull the trigger today. And that's the simple logic of preventive war. But if you really think about the distinction between preemption and preventive war, and what it means to actually take on the risks, the moral liabilities, the legal liabilities of of hitting first, when you do not know what the future holds. Nobody has a crystal ball. It's really just to avoid whatever dark visions of the future you are hoping to, to prevent, simply by delivering a punch against the military capabilities that, that a potential rival is developing. So the core of my argument is, when you think about this logic, I've, even though the German case is at the core of this book, I'm looking at 2,500 years of history. I literally go back to the Peloponnesian War between ancient Athens and, and Sparta, and I look at a number of cases in the modern state system right up to the present time. And what I have noticed is, in the vast majority of these cases, instead of actually neutralizing a future threat by delivering a hit against its army, its weapon systems, whatever is causing you this fear, it actually generates this paradoxical outcome in which you can actually achieve operational success. You can deliver missiles against targets and destroy them. You can fight the adversary in the field and win militarily. But the question is, what have you put in motion from a strategic perspective? And in, in the vast majority of cases historically, what we see is the country that thought it was saving itself from a greater danger in the future actually creates this greater danger. Because you generate a level of hostility, a, a deepening rivalry, and a desire for revenge that comes back to haunt them. And the argument could be, and again, this is all just sort of thinking about possible futures, you're actually facing a much worse situation, paradoxically, even if you win a battleful victory in the near term. So I'm, I'm, this is really at the, the core of uh, the argument mm -hmm. that I'm trying to get out there. Great. I should have mentioned as well that anything I say is not a reflection or I'm not meant to represent the Army Reserve. So the same kind of caveat you said. Um, so as an intelligence officer in the Army Reserve, I'm really interested about strategic futures and foresight. And you mentioned that um, a lot of the, um, the intellectual groundwork underlying this idea of preventive war is it's about fear of the future and trying to prevent some kind of really terrible um, outcome. So there's been a lot, of, um, a lot of advances in intelligence, a lot more technology. Our ability to know what's happening is much greater now 
um, than it used to be. So is there, with, with advances in intelligence, is, are there, is there a decrease in the possibility of preventive war going in the future? I don't necessarily think so because the, the, the real hard nut to crack, and, and you know this better than I do, is intentions. Right. Is, is we can focus on capabilities, and, and our ability to develop intelligence on capabilities is very well refined. Uh, collecting through technical means, through human means, what is it that states are actually creating in terms of the tools they may use in the future? What is really hard, and I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, is figuring out what the leaders of that country will actually do with these tools. Mm -hmm. and, and probing their internal decision-making processes, understanding their long-term objectives, understanding how risk-prone or risk-averse they are. This is delving into a level of psychology and decision-making mm -hmm. and internal political processes that is incredibly difficult to unpack. So if you decide that you're going to take the risks of preventive war, launching war because you believe there's a higher likelihood, there is a greater likelihood than not that this leader developing these new tools will use them in a dangerous way against you, you're really taking a shot in the dark. And I, I think we have to appreciate this fact. Um, there's only so much we can glean through intelligence in terms of what the future actually holds. I completely agree with you. I wanted, wanted to hear your thoughts on that first. So um, I think there's a real danger in believing that um, our, the increase in technology um, associated with intelligence actually gives us more certainty about what the future holds. Uh, my background is as a China specialist, and I spent um, many years studying the, the PLA. And um, intent is really the hardest nut to crack. I mean, we know, um, we, we know more about the Chinese military budget now. We have a much better sense of what their reserve capabilities are. But it's really understanding doctrine. And I think that's something that um, strategists today need to focus on, is, is understanding how doctrine is used, how it's developed um, among our adversaries. And that gives you a better sense of what the range of possible futures are. So um, you've also written a book um, called American Democracy and Preventive War. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the psychology of this and how um, the democratic system plays into that. So in democratic systems, of course, the public has a voice. You talked about lost opportunity. There's a sense of urgency when you see a rising threat. And, and the public may be really placing pressure on leaders to take a decision, whether or not they feel ready to do so or not. So um, how, how do you think leaders should, should deal with that? If preventive war isn't a good option, how should they respond to some of the, the pressures that come in a democratic system when the public is, is feeling fearful? Uh, this is a great question. So when you look at the cases post-Cold War in the United States, uh, in, in which the preventive war option for the first time in American history became something that was politically palatable, that could be talked about openly and actually generate public support. It really is a phenomenon of, of the 1990s up to the present day. This was about the presidents themselves wrestling with shaping a willingness of the American public to actually support this. Uh, we don't see in these cases this outcry, this organic outcry from the American people, from members of Congress, or the widespread opinion that you see in the media to actually take action that the presidents weren't pushing themselves. So when we go back to the early 1990s, there was an active debate over whether or not the United States should attack North Korea. In 1994, the Clinton administration had two principal level committee meetings in the National Security Council to study this very question. The North Koreans had just threatened to pull out of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. They had a very uh, primitive nuclear uh, technology infrastructure, and uh, Secretary of De Defense William Perry was actually uh, advocating very strongly with President Clinton that he authorized strategic attacks to destroy uh, these nodes within the North Korean nuclear uh, facility. This, of course, went on behind the scenes um, and really never percolated to a public level, and President Clinton rejected this. Uh, under President George W. Bush, this really was an, a, a, an idea that came from the Bush administration, and they needed to sell that. So they sold that uh, with a combination of lingering fear, 
of rogue states and, and so-called terrorist allies and this idea of weapons of mass destruction. So it, it's really been about presidents in the last 25 years trying to lead public opinion uh, as opposed to from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm glad you brought up Bill Perry. His, um, Ash Carter was my advisor in, mm -hmm. in grad school. I also took classes with Steve Waltz. So I'm a student of these folks. And of course, Bill Perry and Ash Carter, they came up with this idea of preventive mm -hmm. defense. And they have a whole book about it. Um, and I'd like to contrast their concept of preventive defense with what you're talking about with preventive war. Right, so those are two slightly different concepts. Um, what do you say about the, um, your critique of preventive war is that it's sort of all, all or nothing in, in some ways, um, and you're going too far if you're uh, going with preventive war. But um, Ash Carter and Bill Perry were talking about preventive defense as a range of options, some of which could be short of total war, right? It could be, instead of completely eliminating a threat, you could have a, a limited strike, some kind of raid to take out, to neutralize a specific threat, but not um, engage in a, a really a larger conflict. So um, what do you think about those um, alternatives that are short of, of war? Is that, is that still possible now? Do you think that's um, naive to think that you could limit war in that sense? I don't think it's naive. I think we actually see some very successful preventive measures that fall short of actual military violence. It's a great question. Um, if you think about the Stuxnet virus, for example, this is, a, this is a preventive measure. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is a brilliant operation that's developed and executed, if I should say this as a member of the United States Army, by Israel and the United States, to actually insert uh, a, a virus into the computer systems that controlled the centrifuges that were enriching uranium for Iran's nuclear program. And the, the virus actually set up a wobble. These are highly precise, high-speed uh, high uh, spinning centrifuges, and it created enough of a wobble in thousands of these centrifuges that it literally destroyed them and uh, set back the Iranians' ability to, uh, to enrich uranium by several years. That is a preventive measure. But I think w when you start talking about even limited military strikes, a military strike is a military strike. If it's seen overtly, as an act of violence, and it could come in a full-scale invasion that overthrows a government, like we saw in Iraq in 2003. It could come in the form of an air raid that destroys a facility, like we saw the Israelis conduct against Iraq in 1981. Anywhere on that range of options, if it's overt, if it's violent, if it has physical destructive capabilities, I think this concern about how it might put in motion a desire for revenge, deepen rivalries, deepen hostility, and create that paradox, even if you execute the regime change operation brilliantly, even if you are completely able to destroy the targets that you hit, um, once you move into that side of the equation, those kinds of options, the logic of my book has to be considered mm -hmm. by leaders. Anything short of this, now there's been reporting just in the last week about American sabotage of key rocket parts that are being supplied to Iran uh, that may have led to a series of failed launches by Iran, these ballistic missile tests that they've tried to conduct. That is a preventive measure, because you're, you're trying to have a physical effect to undermine, to somehow neutralize their ability to continue to grow their material power. But it has a very different political effect, because it's quiet, and it's nonviolent. Mm -hmm. So this gets to what you call a preventive war temptation, in some sense. Um, and in the book, you really go deeply into uh, the interwar period, um, especially the Locarno Agreement. Uh, and I think the, the preventive war temptation still exists. And there's an idea mm -hmm. that, that maybe um, with some tweaking, Locarno could have worked. Or in the future, we could, we could manage the risks associated with um, this idea that revenge, the, the wish for revenge is going to grow on the other side, that you could put together some kind of agreement that, um, that doesn't lead in that direction, that you could really manage the aftermath of a preventive war in a way that, that prevents the rise of, of a revenge syndrome. So do you think that's, that's possible? Why, why isn't that um, an, an option? I don't know how you do that. Hmm. 
across this 2,500 years of history that, that I looked at, I really have only found two cases in which the, um, the uh, initiator of a preventive attack actually was not on, a, on the receiving end of an escalation of hostilities and, and actual violence. Uh, and one's an ancient example. It goes actually back to Rome and Carthage. And if you've studied the relationship between Rome and Carthage, they are vying as great city-states and rising empires for dominance in the Mediterranean. They had fought a series of wars against each other, which were really just about uh, diminishing the power of the other so they wouldn't face this threat of, of the rival state. This rivalry ended with the Third Punic War in which Carthage was destroyed. The Romans believed they could not live side by side if they just continued to deliver these these military blows, the Carthaginians would continue to recover. And this would be a lingering nightmare that have to confront. The only way to do this is to literally destroy their society, which is what they did. And the only other example from a modern sense, and there's very little public information on this, it's the Israeli attack against a Syrian nuclear site in 2007. And the best information we have after this, um, uh, Prime Minister Olmert went to Assad just weeks after the attack and said, uh, you, know, you know we did this. We don't tolerate the Syrian regime developing nuclear weapons. If you don't talk about it, we won't talk about it. Let's keep everything quiet. Let's not unnecessarily escalate this. And for some reason, Assad, probably given his strategic weakness relative to Israel, kept his head down, and nothing was made of this. So the, Israeli got, the Israelis got away with it in 2007. There are no other cases of managing the fallout that I've come across. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're, you're taking a baseball bat to Pandora's box, and you just need to be prepared for the consequences. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons that uh, preventive war didn't take place um, with the Germans, the French wanted to uh, engage in <clears> war, <throat> and, the, and the Brits um, sort of shot them down. Yeah. Um, and I want to challenge your interpretation of why, why um, the British decided not to um, engage in that. Now, you're, um, you're saying that their understanding of the strategic consequences was a little bit more sober in some ways, that they saw that, that they had a better understanding of the preventive war paradox, that they weren't going to achieve a more lasting peace, they weren't going to be able to um, achieve their political objectives by allowing the French or by supporting the French in a a preventive war um, into the Rhineland. But um, you know, Churchill's phrase, thank God for the French military, maybe it's just easier because Britain is physically more removed. So they're, it's easy for them to say, okay, France, do you know, engage in this if you want to, but we're, we're not gonna support it um, and just leave it up to the French because they're on the front lines and the British can hang back because physically they're just removed from it. So they have less risk. Um, so it's, it's easy for them to, to opt out. The, 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 uh, the Germans aren't on their doorstep. So it, it's one kind of fear versus an, another in that sense. How do you respond that, to that? That's a very good point. So let me just fill in some of the historic context uh, mm -hmm. uh, behind this particular moment in time. The, the key moment that I'm looking at is 1936, and it's the so-called Rhineland crisis of, of March of 1936. If you go back to the Versailles Treaty that ends World War I, the Germans were prohibited from maintaining any military forces to the west of the Rhine River. If you look, think about the map of Germany, the Rhine River flows from the south to the, to the north, cuts off about a third of, of Germany uh, that borders France, Luxembourg, Belgium, and, and the Netherlands. The Germans were prohibited from maintaining any military forces, developing bases, any kind of exercises within the Rhineland, west of the Rhine River, and this 50 kilometer strip to the east of the Rhine River. And the idea was, this was driven by France. France desperately wanted this buffer zone coming out of World War I for obvious reasons. And this was a great shock to their overall strategy to try to keep Germany indefinitely suppressed as the best route toward European peace and, and French security. So I think you're right in that we can explain the difference in the level of fear between France and Britain because of geography and because of history. 
So I get it. I understand very well why the French government was willing in March of 1936 when Hitler made a surprise announcement and moved a relatively small force west of the Rhine River, created a big crisis, and the French were willing to go. They were willing to use a military uh, offensive with the operational objective of pushing the German force back across the Rhine River and restoring the demilitarized zone. And they made this, though, fully contingent on British political support, at least. And the British vetoed this. So I, I can understand simultaneously why the French preventive war temptation was much higher than the British. But when you go back and you look at the documents, and you look at how British leaders across the spectrum were thinking about the problem, they were worried about, what do we actually set in motion? We're actually going to guarantee another great war. And the consensus position in Great Britain in 1936 was not the way we see it today with hindsight. There was no clarity on what Adolf Hitler was going to do and the fact that they were going to confront a second world war, whatever they, they wanted to do. Um, and they believed they were just going to guarantee a war. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes very clearly through the documents. So the British thought, in a sense, that this ticking time bomb was embedded, in a way, in the Versailles Treaty. Um, mm -hmm. And so there, there's an idea that at some point there's going to be some kind of confrontation around that. So perhaps um, preventive war, uh, it's sometimes if preventive war is delaying, in a sense, um, the other side's ability to build up their power to a greater extent. Maybe that's the best military or strategic outcome you can hope for in the immediate mm -hmm. term. Maybe, yeah. I mean, it's not ideal, but it's better than allowing them to continue to build up unopposed. That's absolutely right. Um, everything hinges on your assessment of the likelihood that they're actually going to act aggressively in the future. Mm -hmm. So clearly by 1938, even you know, after the Munich Agreement and, and a, a, a very serious shift in the tone of the German government in late 1938. By late 1938, there was a consensus position in Great Britain crystallizing very quickly that we have, we have reached a tipping point and we need to confront the German government because uh, it's the only option we have to try to deter, contain, or, or at least defend ourselves against what looks like uh, a threat that's coming. But again, in 1936, what is your assessment of the likelihood of future war if you choose that option that you just described, this is actually the way the, the Israelis describe it today. Uh, the Israelis use this, uh, this phrase, mowing the grass. And it's a very simple analogy. We all understand what happens with your lawn. You mow your lawn to cut it back. The lawn grows. You just cut it back again. And the Israelis have this concept they still work with today that each time a, a pocket of, of power among rivals around Israel continues to grow, you conduct some kind of a military attack to cut the grass. And that may be the best situation you have if you believe that if you allow the grass to continue to grow, it's going to lead to a catastrophic conflict in the future. What you should also be concerned about, however, is whether or not the grass is going to grow back with nuclear blades. <laughs> Right, because human beings are not grass. Grass is an an inanimate object. So to me, the metaphor only goes so far. And mm -hmm. the reaction of your target isn't necessarily going to be, oh, well, let's try it again. Let's just continue to build up. They may make political decisions that take them to a place in which they desire capabilities they didn't desire before. OK, I guess we do need a nuclear weapon now, which is what Iraq said after the Israeli attack in 1981, not before the Israeli attack. Um, or I think we need to ratchet this up. So that's, that would be my warning. That How long can you sustain a mowing the grass strategy until it really backfires mm -hmm. in a worse way than if you had just tried to contain the threat through deterrence and balance of power? Mm -hmm. So part of the relevance for that today, I mean, the question of how, how do you integrate a rising power into the international system? And there's um, a lot of uh, consternation and uh, disagreement about, about China and how we're integrating China into the international system and, and whether attempts to um, integrate it more have actually decreased China's uh, sort of expansionist uh, 
um, instincts that some people see. So w what are some of the options that you would think about with regard to China? If, if preventive war isn't, um, isn't ideal, uh, there are more soft power options available now. Um, what are some of the other things you would think about deterrence? How, would, how do we deter without, without a really strong threat of, I mean, you have, to, you have to demonstrate at some point, right, for the deterrence to be uh, really persuasive. Credibility of your mm -hmm. capabilities and yeah. your willingness to defend mm -hmm. your interests yeah. is key to this. Historically, the classic alternative, frankly, that's much more common than a preventive attack against a rising adversary to, to diminish its power has been balance of power, politics, arms races, alliance building, and sometimes war if necessary, but usually when you're on the receiving end of some kind of aggression by the rising state. So balancing arms races, alliances, deterrence, that frankly, it's not perfect. It comes with risk. But it's about risk management at the end of the day. There's no such thing as absolute security. So you need to figure out how do I produce the kind of military capabilities that will uh, signal my credibility, my willingness to defend what I value in, in enough, enough of a convincing way that a rising China, a rising Iran, North Korea, Russia won't be tempted to actually use some kind of aggressive mm -hmm. acts. So how does that square with um, a point that you make on the, that you end the book with about the importance of humility uh, and sort of taking a, a patient, sober approach to these strategic questions? How do you operationalize humility and how does humility square with deterrence? Yeah, humility, my, my advocacy of humility is rooted in my belief that human beings are very poor predictors of the future. And the logic of preventive war really hinges on your level of confidence that you can see the future clearly enough and you evaluate the likelihood of aggression, the likelihood of a future war with enough clarity that you are willing to pull the trigger and take on all the risks, risks that come with military action. Deterrence falls short of this. It is risky, it is confrontational, and oftentimes in world history it has spiraled into actual military conflict. But there's been wonderful research on this. Philip Tetlock is a political psychologist at the University of Pennsylvania, do, has done wonderful work on this question of, of our ability to predict the future with enough precision to take very bold action. This is he the has, Good Judgment Project? That you're yeah, talking about? he's got 40 years of data in which he has actually tapped into the expertise of foreign policy scholars, of journalists, people who have spent their entire careers studying certain foreign issues, studying certain parts of the world, and he asks them to develop predictions two years out, five years out, 10 years out with a wonderful methodology and then over 40 years, he's been able to go back and evaluate the level of accuracy in their predictions. And he literally concludes that they are no more accurate than pure chance, or in a metaphor he uses in his book, a monkey throwing a dart at a dartboard mm -hmm. could have a more accurate uh, prediction rate than the smartest people on these particular problems. Mm -hmm. So preventive war comes with high risk. And it, it depends on your confidence that you see the future with enough clarity that it's worth taking this action in the first place. So the, uh, the importance of, of prediction, uh, this is something that we talked about a lot when I worked in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the inability to predict and um, the importance of avoiding the temptation to try to predict a specific outcome. Um, and rather instead think about the range of potential outcomes and plan for that. That's, that's something that I think is important for strategists to keep in mind. Um, one more question before we open it up to, um, to the crowd. So we have a lot of um, students in here, um, future decision makers. What advice do you have for them about uh, decision making under um, conditions of uncertainty? So it would begin with a, a healthy dose, dose of humility and an appreciation for the complexity of these issues, a, a, an appreciation for the poor track record that human beings have in terms of being able to predict. I will 
I will end my answer by circling this back to something that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said in 2015, which I think really captures the zeitgeist in the United States right now around this question of, of preventive war in particular cases. And I'll say this up front, this is not a hit against Hillary Clinton. What she was expressing in this interview, this, this talk she gave at the Brookings Institution, reflects a consensus position among many in the United States. This was in September of 2015, if you remember the timeline of the negotiations with Iran uh, that led to the joint comprehensive plan of action that is to cap Iran's nuclear capabilities that was signed in July of 2015. So she's giving this talk. It's clearly ramping up for the political season. She's thrown her hat in uh, for the nom nomination for the Democratic Party. And she, so, so you have to understand the political context. She needs to sound tough on Iran. And she's being challenged in this public forum at Brookings. And she says, quote unquote, I've, I've thought about this so many times, I've, I've memorized the quote. I will not hesitate to use military force if Iran attempts to pursue a nuclear capability. Think about that. I will not hesitate to use military force if Iran attempts to pursue a nuclear capability. She did not say to uh, gain a nuclear weapon, to threaten the use of nuclear weapons, or of course use nuclear weapons, merely if Iran attempted to pursue a nuclear capability. My plea for young people who will be in leadership roles in the future is hesitate. That's all I ask. <laughs> uh, with that, um, I'd like to open it up for questions. I know we have a, a microphone over here, and we're trying to record this. So if you wouldn't mind, if you have a question. Oh, and there's another one here um, to go to one of the two microphones. <coughs> Um, yeah, please. Um, yeah. Go ahead, sir. Oh, okay. And please uh, um, identify yourself. Yes. I'm John McAuliffe, uh, head of a small NGO called the Fund for Reconciliation and Development that worked for years with Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia and is now focused on Cuba. Um, the title probably needs one more example, Hitler's Germany to Maduro's Venezuela, <laughs> because I think we are right now on the verge of launching into a very similar kind of situation. Um, and I think these situations, especially when you're talking about a democratic country, need to have a large chunk of illusion built into them, um, illusion both about the motives and character of the country you plan to attack and the opinions and forces within it, a large amount of self-righteousness about yourself and ignorance of your own history, and um, a very one-sided media interpretation of what's going on because that creates that atmosphere that allows pe us to have thought that we could go into Iraq and the people would welcome us, and that would be the end of the story. We now have this illusion that we push through what's clearly a, a phony humanitarian aid vehicle. Uh, we push that, and that uh, the Venezuelan army is going to essentially welcome us or fall apart. Sir, can you articulate sure. your question? Well, a a quest the question is how much, when you're talking about a democratic situation, how much is, uh, has to happen so that people convince themselves or nation, national leaders convince themselves or convince the population that what you are really engaged in is preventive war as opposed to a uh, war of aggression or hege hege hegemonistic uh, control? So uh, I've been thinking about the Venezuelan case in the context of my own research. And this is the best way I can give you an answer that, that cuts to what's, what I think is behind your question, but somehow tie it into uh, what's on my mind. The Venezuelan case is not classically the same kind of situation you find in a preventive war 
motivated situation. Uh, I think the best example we can have of the United States actually using military force in, in our hemisphere, within our own neighborhood, that falls clearly within the logic of preventive war, it's the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba in 1961. And this is just two years after Fidel Castro is now the new leader of Cuba, and he is aligning himself progressively more and more with the Soviet Union. The fear in the United States, it wasn't about democracy and the nature of the regime per se. It was the fear that Cuba would become a base for Soviet power. And if we allowed this regime to stand 90 miles off America's coast, then it could host strategic bombers, submarines, the kind of military capabilities the Soviets, uh, with, with this uh, proximity to the United States, could actually use in a dangerous way. So the Bay of Pigs is a preventive war, in a way, uh, when you think about uh, a similar example. In the Venezuelan case, unless the US government makes an argument that the Maduro government, or who the Maduro government may host, if this is about the relationship between this regime and Russia, or this regime and China, and only by overthrowing the Maduro regime can we prevent these two rivals from developing a, a foothold, a political, military, or political foothold in Latin America, then you're skirting closer to the preventive logic. But if this is really just about instability and the chaos and the humanitarian uh, issues, it falls in, in a different, different category than, than what I'm working on. Mm. Sir? Uh, good afternoon, sir. My name is Kevin McMullen from No Place in Particular. And uh, mm. I'd like uh, your opinion on uh, the problem of the multiplicity of wars. The Naval War College makes a, um, uh, puts a big emphasis on practicing the economy of enemies. And we have now uh, two wars which we're still involved in. And every time I hear somebody talk about uh, attacking Iran or North Korea, I think, oh, good, we could have three or four simultaneously. Right? Now, part of the problem may be the political objective of each of these wars, that it's too ambitious, that it isn't just the preventive war. It has much bigger aims. And perhaps, though we needed to punish the Taliban, for example, it was a mistake to completely run them out of the country and out of the government. This is a great question. So I've got two thoughts when I think through this idea of multiplying conflicts. And clearly, this is a potential consequence anytime you use military force. But what it comes back to is, what are your political objectives any time you use military force? I'm convinced in the United States, we fixate on military operations. And the United States is incredibly proficient at, at the application of disciplined firepower. We're really good at that. But that's not the problem. The problem is what happens the next day. It's the political end states that you create. So if your political objective is no more sophisticated than here is a set of targets that are potentially dangerous to me in the future, and I can physically destroy them. And once they're destroyed, problem solved. That's a very easy strategic political problem. But inevitably, if it creates all sorts of other political consequences, you can't walk away from that problem. You may create a whole new set of problems that now make you less secure in the future when your entire intention of going in in the first place was to make yourself safer. So all these spin-off effects are, are, need to be in the forefront when you're thinking through these issues. Robert Gates, um, former US Secretary of Defense, has this great phrase. He says, the three least uttered words in Washington, DC are, and then what? Think about that. It's profound. And he, and he thinks he's right. We become focused on what is the military problem? Can we achieve target destruction at a reasonable cost? If yes, pull the trigger. And then what? What happens the next day? Military operations always have an end point. Politics is every day. And are you just proliferating problems that spin <laughs> off from what you thought was going to be relatively clean surgical strike to solve your fears. Thank you, sir. 
Ma'am. Uh, Sandra Stein. I want to ask you about, it uh, seems the new war is cyber war, and mm -hmm. how your ideas would fit into that. And in terms of the advice you gave the graduates, um, I, fin I was reading a book on physics, and as Einstein presented a theory, he said, it seems like, and then the writer says, genius hesitates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. Cyber is a new battlefront. It's a new capability, and it clearly has the potential, as we've all been exposed to in terms of what uh, the threat scenarios hold for cyber attacks, um, do pose threat. They pose a very different kind of threat. And really, the, within the larger history of preventive war, the only case we have of the actual use of, of a cyber attack, of course, does go back to the operation against Iran uh, with the Stuxnet virus to have a physical effect on its ability to enrich uranium. There is so much uncertainty right now in terms of the very character of, of cyber tools and how cyber tools can be employed offensively, how you defend yourself against them, how do you anticipate attack, how do you identify the target, or, or I'm sorry, who, who, how do you identify uh, the responsible party for the attack and therefore pick targets? This is a radically different problem set than states developing visible capabilities that are out there in the world that you can actually use military force to take down. So there's um, just a tremendous amount of uncertainty on what that means. It's, I think we're not great at uh, predicting all the unintended consequences in the conventional war. And now in these new domains, there's so much that we don't understand. Um, there's, there's a lot more to manage in the aftermath of a conflict. Again, if you have a question, please go to one of the two uh, microphones. Um, sir. Hi, I'm Peter Burgess. And, uh, uh, the Queen of England has not given me permission to say what I'm about to say. <laughs> um, I, I'm bothered by the confidence which you talk about things. Um, I've worked internationally for 40, 50 years and in some very interesting places. I was in Afghanistan just after the Soviet withdrew and we did a development plan for Afghanistan and we got zero funding for that, zero, zero, zero. It was even worse than that because in Pakistan next door, USA took its budget from quite big down to zero. I've been in the field a lot. I've tried to communicate with Washington or London or Paris, and I can't believe the dumbness of the people that we got to talk to. I was in uh, Burundi, uh, um, in um, Rwanda just before the genocide. Everybody in the field knew that things were going on, but you, could we get any attention from the policymakers? And I feel very strongly that rather than preventative war, should, we should be pre uh, waging preventative peace. The world is full of nice people. They don't run these countries. They live in the countries, and they are, you know, so soft power has a huge value, I believe. And, I, you know, what can we do to change the idea that we're going to fight our way out of these problems and rather, you know, soft power it, C collaborate, help. The Chinese are far better at this, in my experience, than we are. And this, is, this scares the living daylights out of me. The, you raised some very important points. And over the last 30 years, there's been a tremendous amount of work done by scholars, by concerned think tanks, NGOs, and members of certain governments to think about this notion of preventive diplomacy. And how do you, how do you develop insight into triggers? How do you anticipate the future potential of uh, civil wars, genocide, interstate wars, early enough that you're not at the stage where you actually have to think about military options. Um, so it's not my area of expertise. I know there's a lot of people working on this. I understand your frustration uh, because those 
efforts really don't get the kind of attention, frankly, that the operations that I'm focusing on here do once they reach the potential for violence. I think, unfortunately, one of the reasons that the Chinese are better at wielding soft power in support of their strategic objectives is because it is um, an authoritarian dictatorship. I mean, they, they control the full spectrum of capabilities, and that's not the case with, with the U.S. government uh, to the same extent, obviously. Um, also, under the current administration, there's obviously been a real um, decrease in, um, in the funding for any kind of soft power. So. Yes, and uh, interestingly, so we have a cadet here wearing a German Armed Forces proficiency <clears throat> badge. I think that's very, <laughs> very appropriate for the content. Um, Go ahead. Excuse my ignorance on the, on the, uh, on the topic. I just, I'm just now in international relations, sir. Um, but... Uh, so what if, with the mowing the grass uh, uh, metaphor, what if instead of mowing the grass, you just completely like uprooted the grass, like such a like what we did with like Japan or Germany in World War II? Um, like what if you just completely like like uh, uh, like dissolve their government, you know, completely set it like make sure like you're there when they write the new constitution of their state, and you like ensure that they become an ally or a puppet state of your own? Um, so what about that? Is that just is that naive and arrogant, or is that, and like unrealistic, or is that a possibility? It, it depends on how much you want to bring to the fight, how long you want to be engaged in the fight, both the military fight and the political fight for the long term. It depends on how high the stakes are, right? I mentioned the Carthaginian solution. This is the solution that Rome turned to. You destroy your tar the target completely; they cease to exist as a political entity. Um, the Japanese case is a very interesting one. So you could, you could put American policy in the late 1930s coming into the 1940s against Japan in the larger framework, the larger logical framework of preventive war. What the United States is responding to is Japan's increasing war in China and its increasing territorial control which may ultimately, in President Roosevelt's mind at the time, lead to empire for Japan across all of East Asia, into Southeast Asia, into the Dutch East Indies. And what would this mean once Japan achieved hegemonic status, controlling all of East Asia, and could use this as a base of power to project into the Western Hemisphere, project into other places in the world that America cared about, uh, or merely restrict the United States from getting access to markets and resources or trade routes uh, through East Asia. So the sanctions placed on Japan, cutting off 80% of Japan's steel imports, 100% of Japan's oil imports, they were fully dependent on the United States, was a preventive measure to put the hurt on Japan so they would, re they would pull out, they would reduce their power base and the United States would maintain its, its privileged power position. The Japanese attack then on Pearl Harbor is a preventive attack. As Japan is declining, the goal is you knock out the American fleet, you open up enough time to then drive south and grab Southeast Asia and the Dutch East Indies. Hopefully, before the Americans come back, you've got your solid base. So American policy and Japanese policy in the early 1940s is, is within this idea of trying to undercut the other's power for this very reason. President Roosevelt, in, in, in the early stages of the war, declares, we are going to fight Japan to unconditional surrender. And you think about the hellacious costs and what we had to do to force Japan to accept unconditional surrender was based on a larger vision that President Roosevelt had, which was, we need to fundamentally transform Japan. And he had this larger international vision of cooperation and new political relationships, impossible with the current Japanese political system in power. So the only choice was to grind them into the dirt, force them into unconditional surrender, and rebuild Japan as a fundamentally new entity integrate it into a new international system. So yeah, that was FDR's solution. How often do you want to do that, I guess, becomes the question. Please go ahead. Um, my question is, do you see a way out of you know, this preventive war trap that you know, the United States definitely has gotten into with our political structure, given that you know, general elections, 
campaign start two years before, and there's sort of like a never-ending campaign style that's going on. And what we see now, especially, I like the quote that you gave by Hillary Clinton. Um, I thought that was a perfect example of how, you know, politics comes into this fold. I don't think that, you know, I go back to the example of, you know, President Bush, if he said, we're not going to do anything after 9-11, it would have been like, I don't think he would have gotten reelected. Um, do you see a way out of this trap that, you know, the United States is in? You know, I think when, when you hesitate and you think through the paradox, the preventive war paradox, are you actually creating a worse future situation than, um, than solving? If that becomes part of the way leaders wrestle with this question, do I or do I not attack Iran? Do I attack North Korea? Um, I think there's, there's evidence that we have uh, that comes from the George W. Bush administration and from the Trump administration in 2017 that political leaders are aware of this potential problem. So you go back to 2007, and Israel actually approached the Bush administration asking for a green light to engage in attacks against Iran's key, key uh, facilities within Iran's nuclear infrastructure. The only member of the Bush cabinet that was willing to support Israel was Vice President Cheney. Uh, George W. Bush said no. We, we, we didn't give our permission to the Israelis. The Israelis pulled back. Um, but this was a position that was supported by uh, General Hayden, who was director of the Central Intelligence Agency at the time. Um, and when we look at George W. Bush's memoirs, when we look at Robert Gates's memoirs, and things that, that General, um, uh, the, the CIA director said, all of them argued the reason we didn't give Israel position, uh, permission is that we would actually create the problem we were trying to prevent. We would give Iran the incentive and the moral excuse, the, the political excuse, to move more decisively toward a nuclear weapon. So that was an active concern, that preventive war paradox in the W. Bush administration. General McMaster, when he was National Security Advisor for President Trump in 2017, that was a very difficult summer. If you were watching Fire and Fury, Little Rocket Man, my button's bigger than your button, right? That was a lot of stuff going back and forth. General McMaster gave a, an interview to Newsweek magazine, and he did what any official in his position would likely do, and that's saying all options are, are on the table. And the interviewer kept pushing him. What are you talking about? What are you actually debating within uh, the White House? And General McMaster said, are you asking me if we're, we're talking about preventive war? Yes, we're talking about preventive war against North Korea. I don't know if that was just a moment of frustration, but things that we've heard since then, the de-escalation coming into the latter part of 2017, was once again rooted in this concern that we're just going to actually, again, take a baseball bat to Pandora's box, and it's going to be much worse than just trying to either negotiate with the North Koreans. Even if negotiations fail, I'd rather rely on deterring North Korean aggression than take on this big problem. I, sort of taking the solution that we were talking about a minute ago, um, going to war against North Korea. Because if we, if we go to war against North Korea, it's likely to escalate to a full-scale conflict and regime change. So I don't know what that looks like. It's going to be very costly. But I think it's out there. I think political leaders are at least intuitively uh, aware of, of that potential problem. Thank you. Last question. Yeah. Uh, good evening. I am uh, Sumesh Sibakoti. I am one of the former students of Professor Silverstone. So uh, my question is, uh, do you think uh, criminalizing preventive war uh, against like crime aggression or creating some sort of you know, international norms against preventing attack will uh, lead to a more peaceful world. Why? Why not? We tried that about 90 years ago. Yeah. Um, in the 1920s, preventive war was very deliberately defined in treaty law as an act of aggression. And this is a byproduct of World War I. The German motive, motive, the German motive for seizing this crisis in July of 1914 is really rooted in their deep fear of the continuing rise of Russian power. And of course, Russia is allied with France. That leads to certain requirements to actually uh, 
fight the Russians, but the Russians are the real target for the Germans in 1914. Um, they know they're losing ground. The Russians are modernizing the military, building railroads to the west. Their economy is starting to pick up. And they're deathly afraid that 10 years in the future, the Russians would just crush the Germans, and there'd be no way for the Germans to resist. This is their window of opportunity. <clears throat> Coming out of World War I, this logic and, and the moral guilt that the Germans are now carrying, the war guilt built in to the Versailles Treaty, translates into a series of negotiations that outlaw preventive war, declaring it very bluntly as aggression, not legitimate self-defense. Um, that really didn't have an impact on the debates in the 1930s about Germany, interestingly. And it certainly didn't restrain Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, or later cases that we see. But it's been tried. Good to see you, Samesh. So we're exactly at uh, 7 o'clock at the end of our time together. Scott, thank you so much, and congratulations on this, um, on this very interesting, provocative book. Please join me in thanking Scott for this.